in December of last year, the Philadelphia Police Department started a pilot evaluation of body-worn cameras in one police district. Uh, this evaluation was supported by a research partnership between the Philadelphia Police Department and Temple University's Department of Criminal Justice, including Elizabeth Groff, myself, and Lauren Holt, a graduate student. My presentation today will focus on some of the key findings from that pilot evaluation. Before I proceed, I wanted to acknowledge the many folks in the Philadelphia Police Department who were critical in driving this pilot study. I wanted to acknowledge in particular Officer James Sanchez who really spearheaded this initiative on the ground in the 22nd District. We're very grateful to this whole team in the police. Philadelphia is the fifth largest uh, city in the country. It has the fourth largest police department. It serves approximately one and a half million residents. There's roughly an equal proportion of African Americans and white residents. There's a slightly uh, higher uh, percentage of, of white residents in the city. PPD has long been active in national conversations about the future of policing uh, in the country and globally. Uh, historically, it has long been uh, committed to evidence-based policing as seen, for example, in its participation in the Philadelphia Foot Patrol study, the Philadelphia Policing Tactics Experiment, uh, and currently the Philadelphia Predictive uh, Policing Study. With respect to body-worn cameras, it was really critical for the commissioner of the police department to take a really careful, measured approach to the implementation of body-worn cameras. He chose one police district. He relied on the willing participation of uh, volunteer officers at the district level. It was really critical to be measured in this way in order to ensure that when it came to rolling out the cameras across the city, that that rollout would be smooth and continuous and free of any major barriers or obstacles. There were four key aims to this study. One was to see whether officers' preconceived uh, notions of the cameras, both in terms of the potential effects on the nature of police work as well as the functionality of cameras in different frontline situations, whether those attitudes would shift over time as they were wearing the cameras. Uh, there were certainly uh, particular understandings of the, of the functionality of the cameras on the part of officers and what might hinder their work in the field, and we wanted to really get a sense of those preconceptions at the beginning, not only with volunteer officers, but also with those who didn't volunteer to wear the cameras. We knew full well that over the course of the pilot that the officers who weren't volunteering uh, would be having conversations who those, uh, with those who were wearing the cameras and one wanted to see if there was a sort of osmosis in view. It was also critical for us to examine the range of potential uh, outcomes that mattered to line officers. This was critical for us in light of uh, Cynthia Lem's comment, uh, for example, that the cameras have been implemented in a low information environment. There's much that we don't know about the intended and unintended effects of cameras, and it's really critical to get this right in advance of any large-scale studies. What are those outcomes that matter that we may not have thought of, from a line, especially from a line officer perspective? This would help refine measures for a larger study. We also wanted to identify implementation issues prior to any rollout. At the outset of the study, there were quite obvious technological issues, infrastructure issues that the police department anticipated at the beginning. The details and nuances of these issues uh, uh, emerged over the course of the pilot. But beyond simply the, the technological aspect of implementation, we wanted to get a sense or take a temperature of officer acceptance and buy-in issues. Um, and, and have a really nuanced understanding of these so that these concerns could potentially be allayed at the, uh, uh, at the start of a rollout. Finally, we wanted to isolate the design features of cameras that m mattered most to officers. Uh, it, it is difficult to know in advance 
uh, in, in terms of functionality, in terms of being in a range of, situ uh, of situations in Philadelphia, such as in foot patrols or foot, pa uh, foot pursuits, what matters, what are those design elements that matter most to officers? So this was really instrumental in sort of helping to whittle down the, the types of camera models that, that the Philadelphia uh, police preferred. Uh, not only front end issues were important, but, but also uh, back end usability issues in terms of the video retrieval from the cameras uh, into the uh, cloud or other uh, storage solutions. The study began in December. It ended in May, at the end of May. It took place in one police district, the 22nd district. The 22nd district is north of Philadelphia's city center. Uh, it, it, it has long struggled with violent crime. Uh, it is a, a part of the city that encompasses Temple University's uh, main campus. The pilot study was governed by a body-worn camera working group chaired by Deputy Commissioner Nola Joyce, and it consisted of a range of folks in the police working in different portfolios in the department, including internal affairs, uh, IT, the Research and Evaluation Unit, uh, unit uh, Legal Services. Anyone who had a hand in the implementation of the cameras and who would play a role in rollout were part of this working group and they met regularly. And also the research uh, team was also a member of this working group. There were 41 officers who volunteered to wear the cameras in the 22nd. The, um, this is out of a total of uh, 236 officers who function on patrol in that district. Uh, in that 236 compares to approximately 6,400 individu individuals who are sworn officers in the police department across the city. Uh, the number of volunteers was partly constrained uh, by the number of cameras that we were able to uh, try out. There were f seven different camera models that were tried out on a rolling basis across this period of time. The study design consisted of a mix of qualitative and quantitative data. At the outset of the study, we conducted two focus groups with individuals at the 22nd District. This was purely a convenient sample. In fact, only one officer among those who participated in the focus groups actually ended up wearing the cameras. Uh, our main purpose here was to map onto AIM-2 of the study, which is to really get a sense of what are your potential concerns, not only with respect to functionality, but also in terms of how this might influence police work on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, those two focus groups also allowed us to refine the measures on three different survey instruments. The first survey instrument that we implemented and, and we scoured existing instruments and, and uh, created our own, own instruments based on what we uh, found in the literature, one was a pre and post survey that was designed to gauge officer attitudes um, from, you know, starting from baseline until the end. Did we see a shift? So this maps on to aim one of the study. The sampling frame was all district officers, uh, both volunteer and non-volunteer. We also had a survey designed to capture issues of usability and functionality, and that was tied to each camera model, and they were implemented approximately every month. We also had a daily survey, so we had officers at the end of their shift complete a survey on, you know, did this change uh, particular encounters with citizens? Did you have any issues? Did you see that citizens changed their behavior? There were also some usability questions there, and those were um, simply volunteers who fill, filled out those surveys. Um, at the end of the study, we conducted three additional post uh, pilot focus groups, and these were with, with folks who wore the cameras. Uh, it, was, it also included those who were involved every day in simply administering the pilot program. We wanted to gauge their experiences of, you know, what was it like for you wearing these cameras? What were your experiences? Did this change the nature of police work for you? Um, we also wanted to get a sense uh, of what are some of the barriers to implementation that you could have experienced including challenges of being um, true to the study design. So what interfered with us being able to assess ca these seven camera models on a rolling basis? 
Finally, we're in the midst now of conducting an outcomes analysis of use of force and citizen complaints, as has been done in previous studies, so that's ongoing. In general, then, the qualitative data had two functions in relation to the quantitative data. It first helped us refine the measures on the survey instruments, and it also served an expansion role. It allowed us to really interpret it and understand some of the findings from the surveys. The findings that I'm going to focus on today emerged from the focus groups um, and mapped on to some of the key findings from that first survey, that attitude survey. So what I'm going to focus on today in the interests of time uh, are those interesting data points where we see the qualitative data and the survey data telling the same story or a similar story around how uh, this pilot program evolved. Uh, in the police and how officers experienced uh, the use of body-worn cameras in, in their daily lives. Here are three main findings from that attitude survey. And I should stress that what you see here is uh, the set of findings from both volunteer officers and those who did not volunteer. So this is just a major sort of temperature check, broad picture of uh, rise in levels in three key areas. One, there was a question we asked whether <coughs> officers thought that the cameras should be expanded. And we see a positive increase in officers saying, yes, they should be expanded. And I'll use the fo focus group findings to, to help explain that. Also, the question, do the advantages of wearing the cameras outweigh the disadvantages? We saw an increase in this as well. As one officer put, put it in, in, in a focus group, he said, you know, once you start wearing the camera, you really begin to see the advantages. You see that these cameras are protective for officers. There's nothing better than simply wearing the camera. So even officers who might be hesitant at first, they begin to experience those benefits as, as time goes on. And as one officer put it, we are ready. This organization is now ready uh, to implement this citywide. We also saw an increase in the level of comfort with footage being reviewed. Um, as one um, member of the uh, in, uh, Internal Affairs Bureau put it to me the other day, you know, we're not out on a fishing expedition. You know, this is not our intention. Officers began to see uh, that the footage was being used in ways that would be protective of them, especially in citizens' complaints. Uh, and so I'm going to elaborate on that now. <laughs> The, the, the design features, and th this is an important piece, it's a technical piece, but it's, it's really important because it does tie to the nature of police work and officers' comfortability with the technology and their acceptance of the technology. Durability, I can't overstate how important durability is as, a, as a, an important de design feature of the camera, even if it's heavier. Um, the resiliency of the docking station is also important. And in particular, the resiliency of the pins in the docking station. So every day when you're coming in and you're, you're taking your camera out of the docking station and you're putting it back in and this wear and tear, some camera models just simply didn't have the resilience. Uh, and so the, the longevity of the docking stations was important. Having a strong clip was, was equally important. Officers were concerned about the cameras falling off, uh, especially heavier cameras. Some of the clips uh, did not have the right the tension that they needed to keep uh, those cameras in place. In Philadelphia, there's at least six, if not eight, different types of uniforms that officers wear, ranging from polo shirts to the normal uniform. They all have different textures, they all have different thicknesses, and also different locations where those body-worn cameras can be placed. So having a clip that keeps its tension was absolutely critical. If cameras fell off, it meant that during a hectic situation, an officer would have to retrieve it, and in worst case scenario, it could end up in the wrong hands, in the hands of a, of a citizen. So keeping that camera on their uniform was really critical. The simplicity of the on and off switch was critical. Officers needed to know once they developed that muscle memory that they could turn that camera on uh, with ease that it wouldn't turn on accidentally or unintentionally, so the, sen the button couldn't be too sensitive. Same goes with the off switch. 
video retrieval at the back end, so that the ease at which the footage from those cameras could be uploaded into their storage solution was also very critical, obviously, especially for those folks who, on the IT side of things who are charged with transferring that data. The capacity <coughs> to document police work was, was a virtue of the cameras that e even we on the research side underestimated. Officers were saying, you know, cameras are protective. They protect us uh, in cases of false or exaggerated uh, complaints. This, of course, is consistent with previous studies. Um, if you, um, if if a citizen knows that an encounter is being recorded, they will likely not uh, file a, a bogus complaint. But also, when there are complaints filed, the footage is there to swiftly deal with, with instances and, and officers can move on with their lives. So that translates into less time lost um, if you are suspended, if you're being under the scrutiny of, of IEB. Uh, there were also concer initial concerns about IEB um, sort of watching over officers as, uh, again, using the term, you know, fishing expedition. Th that, those concerns really eased over time. And so what officers are doing now, those who have worn the cameras, is they're saying to their peers, look, these cameras are protective of you. This, the, you know, the, there's trust here on the part of the organization's motives. The videos also help create documentaries of arrests, right from that initial point where you enter a situation right until the end. That helps, as one officer puts, seal the deal in a court case uh, there's no ambiguity. It's captured the whole encounter from beginning to end. And so it also helps mitigate concerns with somebody, you know, recording with their own phone, a citizen recording just a snippet of an encounter and, distor and distorting what happened there. Uh, officers were also saying, you know, I can enter a crime scene. I can take my camera and take some video footage and get a good range of view. I can use my camera to take still photos of evidence at a scene. I can even count on my colleagues who are coming onto the scene to take videos of different vantage points uh, of those scenes. So the contribution to evidence gathering was also um, noted uh, by officers. Some other interesting benefits that we hadn't anticipated also emerged in the focus groups. For example, when officers were managing a public protest. Uh, of course, it's critical, as, as you know, when you're trying to manage a demonstration wh when there is unlawful conduct, that you do not break the line, that you stay in place. So the cameras can help uh, take an image of people who may be behaving uh, unlawfully and capture their IDs so that you cannot break the line and perhaps uh, intervene with those protesters later. Another interesting example was given of, of Another example, really, of documenting police work where if citizens are organizing other public events like bl block parties, which are in Philly are referred to as coming down parties, uh, an officer was saying we had several of these being planned in our neighborhoods. We went up uh, to the organizers with our cameras on and we said, look, this is how this is going to play out. These are expectations. These are rules of behavior. Uh, this is when we are going to enforce them and in what situations and so on. And the officer claimed that simply documenting that standard setting, that expectation setting, uh, really helps set a tone uh, that you're accountable here when you run these block parties. Finally, enhancing um, the quality of written reports was noted as a benefit. So officers now know that if that encounter was captured, uh, on video that their written reports would have to be rigorous enough and, and sort of factual enough to map on to what, what was captured in the video. So they see the benefits of enhancing the quality of those written reports. In terms of police community relations, and I, and I should stress that the conversation that I'm going to recount is specific to the 22nd District, which is known for uh, tensions, uh, has a long and deep history of uh, police community relationships that may not apply to other districts in Philadelphia. Officers were saying, look, cameras can influence what happens during an encounter. Uh, it might cause a citizen to be calmer uh, during that encounter. It could cause them to be more compliant, uh, including in public protest situations. 
But when we asked them about whether the cameras could have a longer term effect on police uh, community relationships, they were much more hesitant uh, and, and expressed great caution around that. In fact, they were suggesting that it would be naive to think that cameras are a panacea for police community relationships. They said, you know, there's such a long and deep history in this district and cameras aren't going to fix this. Uh, so this is something that we think merits greater consideration uh, in future studies. And I know that there's some great new studies coming out now there, uh, that are measuring uh, police-citizen uh, relationships. Finally, in terms of information flow, we asked officers whether they thought the cameras would have an effect either positively or negatively on the flow of information from citizens to police. And the response we got was pretty neutral. In, the, in this particular district, information flow is suboptimal. It's not where police want to see it. And they stress to us that where information flow does happen, it's often uh, by phone. When people phone into the district, there isn't as much face-to-face -face information sharing. Where there is that information sharing in this particular district, there is a, a larger concern with re retaliation or what they describe as snitching. So from time to time, people can request that the cameras be turned off uh, when um, that information is being shared. But again, this is a pilot study, and this is something that we should keep our eye on uh, during the rollout. Finally, will cameras have a chilling effect on police discretion? I'm posing this as a question because that due to the size of the study, we don't have the answer, but we can only express the concerns that were expressed to us by some officers. Will discretion narrow over time? We all know that there's uh, a great many situations in which officers choose to use informal means to handle situations, and that is the staple of good discretionary police work. Uh, will officers feel that they're going to be, have to be more legalistic in the handling of certain matters, more by the book? Um, will officers choose not to enforce certain behaviors at all? Uh, because if they know they're going to be under the gaze of the camera, they don't want to be scrutinized for not being by the book. Uh, and in when, you know, when it comes to minor criminal behavior, could, could we see that effect? We don't know. I think this is a provocative finding from the focus group, but needs to be tested uh, in a very careful way in future studies. Finally, officers were concerned that you know, cameras obviously don't capture everything, when officers are going into a scene and they see somebody who they happen to know, for example, is a drug dealer that works that corner and has been working that corner for a long time, they're approaching that situation with what Egon Bittner described as area knowledge, right? They know this area, they know the players, they know the networks. And so that provides context to that encounter and to perhaps the choice to stop and talk to them, uh, have a conversation with them, and so, of course, that contextual knowledge is not, is not there. So there was just, you know, a hesitation. Uh, and again, we raise this as, as more uh, pro thought-provoking ideas th than anything else. So implications in terms of, of practice and in terms of larger scale studies, including in Philadelphia during a subsequent rollout, it's really important that there be clear messaging from police leadership, not only at headquarters, but at the district levels, all districts, on the continued value of good police discretion. Uh, that there is not an agenda here to narrow discretion, to encourage more legalistic policing, to encourage under-policing or over-policing, for that matter, of certain behaviors. Um, officers themselves, line officers themselves, are important messengers here, those who have already worn cameras. They're, you know, they're being champions with their fellow officers who might be hesitant now. They're saying, look, if you're doing good discretionary police work, continue to do it. That's what's valued, but it's, it's that initial hesitation that needs to be addressed in the messaging from leadership. In terms of research, uh, we would argue that we need refined measures that capture potential chilling effects on discretion. So over time, are we seeing certain areas of police activity going up? Are we seeing certain areas of police activity going down? Uh, ranging from quality of life enforcement to pedestrian stops. What, you know, could there be something going on here? I think it would be 
uh, remiss of anyone not to capture this over a long period of time because this will help us tap into any potential effects on police discretion. Hopefully there aren't any, uh, but it's important to, to know this. Finally, there could be district variation uh, in the ways in which cameras might be influencing police-citizen relationships uh, over time. This is an opportunity to bring in a place-based perspective here. Is there, are there certain characteristics of particular neighborhoods or communities that might be mediating or moderating the effects of cameras on police-citizen relationships over time? Is there something about the history of particular relationships in particular places um, that's, that's really important for us to know in telling the story of whether cameras are influencing uh, those relationships over, over time. So citywide measures are great, but drilling down to the level of place and to the level of district, we argue, is important here. The, um, the task I was given for this presentation is a little bit different. I was asked to provide more of a, a 30,000 foot level view of the issues surrounding this technology. So uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, there are four different parts of, uh, of my presentation. I want to start by talking about some of the issues that have been raised with body-worn cameras and uh, there have been a lot of claims about the technology uh, made by advocates and critics, so I think it's important to look at that. I want to talk a little bit about the research evidence that we have to date and then I'll transition and talk about some of the resources that are available. Uh, in particular, I want to talk about the, uh, the BJA National Body-Worn Camera Toolkit and then I'll wind up talking about, uh, talking about next steps. Next slide. Before getting into the issues, though, I, I did want to take a, a minute and um, just uh, step back and, and think a little bit about how far we've come with this technology. Uh, there, there's a lot on this slide, uh, but there's really two takeaway messages uh, I want you to get. Uh, the first takeaway message is that uh, law enforcement interest in body-worn cameras predates the, the Ferguson, Missouri case by several years. Uh, as you can see from this slide, as early as 2005, there were some police departments in the UK that were experimenting with body-worn cameras. The Oakland, Oakland Police Department, as far back as, as 2009, 2010, as part of their consent decree, was rolling out body-worn cameras. So clearly, um, you know, August 9th, 2014 in Ferguson marks a, a line in the sand. But really, as I said, law enforcement in interest predates that. It's really after the Ferguson case that, that media interest, political interest, and, and citizen interest really uh, took off. And, and certainly as a result, then, uh, the expansion has occurred in law enforcement. The second takeaway message from this slide is, uh, is that there is tremendous federal support for body-worn cameras. Uh, you can see uh, it was part of the, the president's uh, community policing plan. Um, certainly, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the toolkit, and then uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, the Department of Justice will be making announcements about the, uh, the 50 or so awards that will go to police departments as part of the, the body-worn camera pilot implementation program, and $17 million has been set, up, set aside this year alone with more funding next year. Uh, next slide. Just a, a brief plug for the report that, uh, that Cynthia mentioned. A lot of what I'm talking about this morning uh, is articulated in greater detail in this report that I wrote. It came out last year. Uh, so if you're interested in a little more detail of some of the things I'm talking about uh, this morning, you can, you can look at that report. It's on the OJP website or certainly uh, just Google it and, and, and you can take a look. Next slide. The, this slide shows uh, at the time that I wrote this report last year, uh, really the, the entire body of knowledge on body-worn cameras, uh, these five studies. Um, the, the few studies from the UK, unfortunately, were pretty weak methodologically, there was, so there wasn't a lot uh, that we could take from those studies. Uh, so really what we've been talking about is, is three studies, and, and if I were to, to write that report today, uh, or an updated version, as you can see, there'd be some additions down at the bottom as well, but I think um, the, the takeaway from this slide is that uh, the research uh, still is, is pretty thin. Next slide. So what you see here 
uh, and this is getting into the, the issues. Um, this, this slide provides, uh, at least in my view, an overview of the, the primary benefits or perceived benefits of police officer body-worn cameras. And, and what I've done is I've created a, a legend at the bottom that then indicates, in my view, the, the amount of empirical support for each of the, the benefits. And, and you can see there are a lot of question marks and, and squiggly lines, meaning that uh, either we have no research evidence or we have some and we need more. In terms of the benefits, I think um, uh, Professor Wood mentioned several of these. Uh, increased transparency and legitimacy. Uh, a big one is behavior change. Uh, does the fact that a police officer is wearing a body-worn camera, does it result in changes in the officer's behavior and the citizen's behavior? And certainly the evidentiary value is another, uh, is another perceived benefit. So again, I think the, the takeaway is that there's um, lots of, of perceived advantages of police officers wearing these cameras. Uh, the research evidence uh, is still fairly thin. Um, next slide. Now that being said, I think there is uh, some compelling evidence from some of the studies that we do have to date, and, I, and I'd like to review some of that evidence. Uh, if you've been following the, the dialogue about this technology at all, you've heard of the Rialto Police Department. The Rialto study has gotten a lot of attention, and with good reason. It was a rigorous design, a randomized controlled trial. And you can see uh, from this slide looking uh, at some of the really extraordinary uh, uh, findings that we have with regard to drops in citizen complaints and use of force after police officers in that department began wearing cameras. And there's some caveats to the, to the Rialto study, and I don't, I don't need to get into those, but really uh, compelling stuff coming out of Rialto. About the same time, the Mesa, Arizona Police Department also completed their study. Um, importantly, the, the results from Mesa were very similar to the results from Rialto in, in terms of complaints and use of force. Another interesting finding from Mesa uh, involved administrative policy. The study in, in Mesa lasted about a year. Uh, the first six months of the study, they had a fairly restrictive policy. Essentially, officers were instructed to activate the camera whenever they had an encounter with a citizen. The second six months, uh, they relaxed the policy. It was more discretionary. And what they were, uh, what they were able to show is then uh, when when officers were operating under the more discretionary policy, the number of activations dropped substantially by 42 percent. And uh, they subsequently implemented or reinstituted, I guess, the, the more restrictive policy. A few months ago, I was at a presentation and I heard uh, the lieutenant in uh, the Las Vegas Police Department talk about what I thought was kind of a unique way to operationalize impact. And he talked about the number of officers who were exonerated from allegations in, in citizen complaints. And I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. Next slide. This slide, and if you, if you advance it one more time, you should see a red arrow. Uh, two weeks ago, I was presenting in Atlanta with the assistant chief from Oakland PD, and he used this slide, so I asked if, if I could borrow it. The, um, you know, this, this shows findings on the order of Rialto in terms of reductions in uh, both use of force and in complaints. And obviously there was a, there's a lot going on in Oakland with regard to their consent decree and, and the reforms that they were implementing. So uh, there, there may be more at play here than just the, uh, the implementation of body-worn cameras. But clearly we're starting to see uh, some, uh, some consistency in the findings with regard to, at least with regard to complaints and, and to a lesser extent, use of force. Next slide. The, the Phoenix evaluation that was completed uh, just a, a few months ago as part of their smart policing initiative. Uh, again, we see some reductions in complaints against uh, officers, uh, not quite as large as the complaint uh, drops that we've seen in some of the other studies. But if you'll notice, the, uh, the, the trends in complaints among officers who were not wearing cameras in Phoenix was actually going in the, in the opposite direction. The second bullet gets to a, perhaps a point that uh, Professor Wood was discussing with regard to officer discretion, and uh, perhaps this finding is, uh, is consistent with the concern about restrictions on officer discretion because the officers in Phoenix who were wearing cameras experienced a fairly significant increase in their uh, daily arrest activity, and this is compared to officers who were not wearing cameras. 
the Phoenix Police Department was also interested in the, the downstream effects of body-worn cameras, particularly with regard to domestic violence cases. So uh, they were looking specifically how the, the presence of this new form of evidence was affecting how uh, domestic violence cases were being handled. And as you can see, uh, there were a number of indicators suggesting that uh, the body-worn camera video enhanced the processing of domestic violence cases, more likely to have cases char charged and filed, and then more likely to get uh, guilty pleas and, and convictions at trial. Next slide, please. So transitioning a little bit to the, to the other side of the coin uh, with regard to issues, what you see here uh, are, are some of the primary concerns that have been raised about the, uh, the technology. And again, looking at the legend, uh, at least in my view, I think the evidence is a little more strong here in terms of uh, support for these concerns. And, and I, could, I could talk for several hours about these, and I, and I won't. Uh, but the, uh, the privacy concerns are significant, and that's, uh, there are two elements to that. You have concerns about citizen privacy and also concerns about officer privacy. Um, the other thing I would mention, jumping down to the bottom, obviously, you know, when a police chief decides to adopt body-worn cameras, it represents a tremendous commitment, a tremendous amount of resources are required in terms of logistics, manpower, and cost. It's relatively easy to buy the cameras and put them on officers. After that happens is when things really start to get uh, complex. Next slide. A couple of other, the, uh, other concerns that I've observed over the last year or so. One of the big ones I think right now being discussed is whether or not officers should be permitted to review their video prior to making uh, statements and writing reports. This is uh, particularly contentious with regard to officer-involved shootings. Should officers be able to look at the video before they make a statement? Um, some of the other concerns I mentioned, uh, uh, public records, I believe. Uh, a lot of this really deals with, with state law with regard to uh, public records requests, and, and, and I think a lot of state laws are a bit antiquated and are not really equipped to handle this kind of technology. So there's lots going on in terms of uh, if there's a release of, of a video, what needs to be redacted and, and how that's going to be done. <clears throat> over the summer, there were uh, over 100 legislative bills in 34 states being considered with regard to body-worn cameras. So a lot is happening at the, at the state level as well. Next slide. The, the Four Science Institute, Bill Lewinsky, has been doing some really interesting work in terms of the limitations of body-worn cameras, in terms of what they show. And uh, if you're not familiar with his work, I, I uh, encourage you to take a look. Very interesting. <clears throat> the Phoenix study, I think, also demonstrated um, the, the implications of body-worn cameras for downstream criminal justice actors, in particular the prosecutor. This technology has significant resource implications for prosecutors. Um, one of the, the, the side effects of the Phoenix study when they were looking at the domestic violence processing, uh, I showed you before some of the, the positive outcomes. Uh, what you see on this slide is that uh, you know, this, this is new evidence and it had an impact in terms of how long it would take to process a domestic violence case. I think this may change over time, but clearly there was a learning curve in Phoenix with regard to prosecutors being familiar with this evidence and then working out the, um, the, the systems to, to ensure that prosecutors have access and can, uh, and, and can use the evidence in the case. The last uh, concern I'll mention is, is activation compliance. Uh, and this, this goes to the issue I, I, I talked about with the MESA study, the administrative policy issue. So departments will have a policy that says, you know, when officers should, should activate a camera and when they shouldn't. What are departments going to do if officers are not following that policy? Next slide. What you see here is, is from Phoenix. This is monthly compliance rates with uh, activation. So what you see is that in May of 2013, compliance... Uh, reached its peak at 42%, which tells you that that month, about 60% of the time, officers were not activating the camera in situations where they were supposed to. And you can see how, how the trend uh, 
essentially goes down over time. And overall, it was about 30%. So about 70% of the time, officers were not activating the camera in cases where policy dictated that they should. Next slide. Uh, this just shows the, the, the compliance rates by call type. And you can see that with domestic violence, uh, compliance rates were highest, but they were still under 50%. Next slide. Now, uh, shifting gears a little bit to talk about resources, I did want to talk about the, the body-worn camera toolkit. The, uh, the toolkit was rolled out in, in May, and you see the website there. Uh, and, and you can certainly go and, and take a look. I will say that the, the toolkit, the, the creation of the toolkit actually began back in February. The, uh, uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, BJA, hosted a, a two-day panel at the White House with about a, a hundred experts that they brought together to, to brainstorm all of the issues with this technology. Uh, the picture that you see is, is from the toolkit. Uh, that's myself and, and a colleague from ASU, Dr. Charles Katz. Chuck and I uh, facilitated that, that panel. I like this picture for a couple of reasons. One is that it, it looks very official with the flag. Uh, and also, Chuck's looking at me like I'm saying something that's really intelligent, which I, I probably wasn't. Um, the, 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 this two-day panel really, as I said, started the discussion about the toolkit. So over the next uh, few months after the meeting, uh, Chuck and I worked with, with the folks at BJA to create the content for the toolkit. And the toolkit really is, it's an information warehouse. It's a place for anyone to go who has questions about this technology, whether you're a chief of police, a civil rights attorney, a reporter, a concerned citizen. You can see the, uh, the categories of, uh, of information that are that are listed. And I've got a couple of, uh, of shots of the toolkit that we can look at. Uh, the other thing we did is we created a law enforcement implementation checklist, and it's uh, a guide for police departments to, to use when they're planning and implementing their body-worn camera programs. It, it just provides a list of all the issues that, uh, that should be considered. <clears throat> Next slide. The next few slides are just uh, images from the toolkit, and as this is the, the main page, and you can see across the top the drop downs of the different areas where <clears throat> um, you can you can explore issues. The toolkit is in a FAQ format, so uh, next slide. Essentially, you, you you click on the question, and then there's a drop down with uh, with information and resources for that question. The toolkit also has a series of podcasts from experts. Here we see uh, the director of BJA, Denise O'Donnell, and the, the podcast provided different, uh, additional information uh, about the, the, the different areas of concern with this, with this technology. <clears throat> Next slide. This is just a, a shot of the, the law enforcement implementation checklist, and it's designed to be used just as, uh, just as it's called a checklist of issues to be considered by departments uh, as they're, they're rolling out their body-worn camera program. Next slide. And uh, this is one more image. This is the, uh, the training slide. Again, this shows the, the, the drop down with the information that's, that's available. Next slide. A couple of other resources I wanted to mention. These are also actually available through the toolkit uh, as well as uh, in other places. PERF and, and COPS put out a report last year looking at some of the, the policy issues. Very interesting report. NIJ has done a, a market survey of vendors. I think there has to be now probably two dozen different vendors that are available selling this, um, this technology. And then, uh, then, of course, there have been some model policies that have been, uh, that have been put out, IECP and the ACLU, for example. Today I'll be discussing the Urban Institute's current evaluation on police body-worn cameras. The study has a number of components to it, and I'll briefly detail each but the focus of the presentation will be on the measurements of community attitudes and how the cameras may influence community, police community interactions. Before I get into urban study, I want to first talk about a very recent research brief from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, I wasn't involved in this, in this research brief, but it's important to br uh, mention this briefly. I'm not sure if any of the authors are in the study, but if I do any injustice, please just let me know. Um, this report, which was released last month, provides some research to a national survey of public attitudes toward body-worn cameras. And it, this is great doing this. 
We as researchers know very little about how the public actually feels toward police use of cameras. We have some ideas and thoughts on how they might feel, but there's not much empirical support one way or the other. National surveys on the topics such as this one are an important first step to better understanding the community's perceptions. Uh, continuing with the, the study, um, from a sample of uh, 635 respondents, the University of Nevada um, provides key insights on a number of issues facing body-worn cameras today. The report covers many topic areas uh, scholars and practitioners around the country are currently dissecting, uh, such as would the officers tell, should the officers tell the community member that they're actually recording at that moment, or whether or not there are members, or whether or not there are any members of the public who, who should have access to the footage obtained by the cameras. As an aside, um, if you're interested in learning more about the many nuances of body-worn camera policy, I recommend reading through the Urban Institute's recent online policy debate. Many of the policy issues were discussed among a panel of experts, including myself, law enforcement executives, a civilian oversight expert, a civil libertarian, and other Urban Institute research staff. Getting back to the University of Nevada's report, I found it interesting that 86% of the respondents felt that police equipped with a camera will, have, will behave more respectfully towards citizens in general. However, only 61% felt that citizens will have greater trust in the police because of the cameras. This is an interesting divide. As research on procedural justice has found a strong relationship between respectful officer behaviors and increased views of their legitimacy and trust. Obviously, more study is needed on this relationship. However, general community perceptions obtained through national surveys will not be able to provide much insight. Instead, we need to focus on the perceptions specific of community members who have had a police interaction. And as we know, this is a specific group of the general population, approximately only one quarter of the public. These are the people that we need to be surveying. We need to understand how presence and use of body-worn cameras may affect their behaviors and attitudes during, during police interactions. Of course, we need to identify how the cameras will also affect the behaviors and attitudes of the officers which could be discerned through community, this community population, but we can also include department administrative records as well as footage review to get at the officer behaviors and attitudes. The Urban Institute is conducting a, a community survey. Uh, we're conducting an evaluation that uh, will accomplish a community survey through a two-year study funded by the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. Uh, there are three participating police departments in this study, Anaheim and Long Beach Police Departments in California, and the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police in Pennsylvania. The study utilizes a factorial random control trial, which assigns officers into one of three groupings, a no camera control group, a camera only group, and a camera group assigned a script. There are three main sources of data to measure the differences between these groups. The first is through coding of the video footage from the cameras. The second is through the traditional administrative records as well as metadata that the cameras collect. And finally, we survey community members on their interactions with the officers from the study. Regarding the camera group that is required to state the script, uh, the script is based on the tenets of procedural uh, justice policing with the aim of increasing community members' views of transparency and trust during, toward the officer and the agency overall. The script reads, hello, my name is Officer Lawrence. To better serve the community and to be transparent, the police department is now using body-worn cameras. Before we start, I would like to inform you that our interaction is being recorded. Analyses of how this group compares to the standard camera-wearing officers who do not have to say anything about the camera to the community members will add new information to the field. The current literature lacks methods to best inform the public that the officer is recording the interaction. With the introduction of the cameras, community members may become hesitant to willingly provide information to officers during investigations or may become disrespectful when they feel their rights are being violated by being recorded. With the inclusion of this group, we aim to identify the best practices of how to best convey that the recording is occurring and to impact of doing so during a, and measure the impact of doing so during police community interactions. We are currently in the third month of data collection. Uh, for one site right now. Each site will have six months of data collection and um, during that period we'll collect information from the community surveys, uh, we'll code the footage, the video footage, and we'll also collect uh, the metadata 
from uh, tasersevidence.com. Uh, Secondary data collection, which includes the administrative records, will cover the study period as well as three years prior to the start of the data collection for each site. As you can see, we're very early on in the data collection period. As a result, preliminary results cannot be provided at this time, but the methodology is still interesting enough to talk about. As I mentioned earlier, the officers within each site are randomly assigned into one of the three groupings. A stratified random, random sampling method was used to restrict the possibility possibility of imbalances across the groups due to differences in the officer's position, tenures, and race. Officers are, are allocated as evenly as possible across the three groupings. Only one site has had its officers randomly assigned to date. Uh, 60 officers agreed to participate, and you can see here that the stratified random sample was successful in creating equal groupings across the strata. I'll also be comparing these percentages to the overall department characteristics in the future as well. I'll now detail the main methods of the study. The first data source is the coding of the video footage. Each week, uh, the police department sends urban Excel files of all community interactions that each participating officer conducted in the prior week. Some cases, such as sensitive sexual offense or domestic violence of offenses, uh, domestic violence offenses are removed. But of the remaining cases, 15% are randomly selected for fit footage review. Because of the sensitive nature of the video footage, project staff are required to review the footage in-house, that is, within the police department. Staff members code the footage on paper surveys, and then they enter the coding sheet into an online database created on Qualtrics. We hope to learn many things by reviewing and systematically coding the video footage. First and foremost, it will provide a unique view of the community interaction. While we are surveying the community member, we are not surveying the police officer. So the footage provides another perspective of the interaction. This could be called the researcher's perspective. It will allow us to determine how reliable the community members' responses to the surveys are and their viewpoint of the interaction. Also, a unique aspect of body camera technology includes a buffering feature, whereby the camera begins recording video, not audio, for a period of 30 seconds prior to the officer pressing the button. This buffering period will be a critical component of the study's analysis, enabling us to identify, code, and analyze the factors leading up to an officer's decision to start recording. Finally, footage review will provide information to the degree officers in the second treatment group, uh, which is the camera only group, or, or excuse me, which is the camera, on, camera and script group, um, the degree that they're actually stating the script and, uh, and analyzing the reliability of that. Um, we'll also be able to measure the differences in officer conduct between the two camera groups. Part of the second uh, data source includes analysis of officers' administrative records. As I mentioned earlier, we will collect uh, three and a half years worth of key departmental performance metrics that will be used to assess whether and how officers alter their typical interactions with citizens as a result of being equipped with a body-worn camera. Historical community interaction records will be collected to determine the typical interactions officers handle prior to camera implementation. And traditional officer performance metrics, such as use of force and citizen complaints, will also be reviewed. Time series analyses will be conducted using these data. Presented here is just an example, but this is information. But with this information, comparisons between the control and the treatment groups will be will be assessed to identify changes of officer behavior as a result of camera use. This will include use of force, number of citizen complaints, number of arrests, citations and warnings, as well as changes in the amount of officer-initiated stops or changes in the typical types of interactions they have every day. Cameras are not recording on a continual basis, as the storage space required to house that volume of footage is currently prohibitive. In the future, this may be possible, but as of right now, it is not. Even with an agency policy, policy prescribing when officers should start recording, officers have considerable discretion when to record. This begs the question of what interactions are purposely not being recorded by the officers and why. Regardless of departmental policy, it is likely that there is a high degree of variation in officers' use of cameras. We'll examine these differences related to different outcomes. For example, perhaps low-use officers have lower use of force and citizen arrest because they're able to use their verbal conflict resolution skills more effectively. Or perhaps high-use officers are more conscientious and have better outcomes. 
To answer these questions, additional in-house data will come from tasersevidence.com uh, metadata and linked to the administrative data. Um, Tasers data includes the date, time, footage length, officer, and case IDs, and any tags the officer may have assigned to uh, each and every video footage. The above data sources will be primarily used to assess changes in the officer's behavior, changes in the officer's behaviors as a result of body-worn camera use. But perhaps more interesting is how the camera use and procedural justice script affect the attitudes of community members who have interacted with those officers. To measure these perceptions, Urban is conducting a survey with community members who have recently had an interaction with an officer who is part of the study. As I mentioned before, each week the department sends Urban data for, for of, uh, regarding the officers, completed street checks, um, calls for service, and crime reports. Some of these data are excluded, for example, if there's no telephone number provided or if the record pertained to a company and not an individual. Staff on the project then call the community member to obtain their participation in the study. The telephone interviewers are blind to the officer's grouping in the study and they are not allowed to make more than five calls per week or per case. On average, the survey takes about 15 minutes for the community member to complete. This methodology actually comes from the National Police Research uh, platforms Police Community Interaction Survey, uh, which uh, Steve Mastrowski and Dennis Rosenbaum and um, Lori Ferdell and, and others were involved in um, and led. Uh, the platform's response rate for that survey was 34.4%, and at last check this morning, Urban's community survey can, currently has a response rate of about 20%, but we're still in the data collection period, so we're still catching up to earlier cases that we're, um, that we're trying to reach the community member, member for. <clears throat> a range of topics are discussed with the community member during the survey. The main bulk of the questions regard the degree of the officer's procedural justice behaviors during the interaction. These include items focusing on the quality of the officer's treatment toward the community member, the quality of their decision making, as well as whether the officer provided any important information during the interaction. Use of force items cover a range of vital behaviors the officer may have exhibited, as well as any vital behaviors that the community member may have exhibited during the interactions. There are also more general questions, similar to those at the University of Nevada's national survey, um, that, can, that regard the community member's attitudes towards body-worn cameras in general. It'll be interesting to see how the presence of a camera may affect these general attitudes towards cameras um, once the analyses are done. And finally, uh, items covering the community member's perception on police department's overall legitimacy, as well as their willingness to cooperate with law and officers are discussed. The resulting data set will naturally be multi-leveled because uh, each participating officer will have multiple community member interactions. As such, hierarchical linear models will be used to analyze the data where level one will consist of community members' responses to the survey and level two will be the data of the officers. As the other two sites um, data is added to this, uh, there will be a third departmental level um, to the data. Presented here is an example HLM on satisfaction with an encounter. Um, you can see that level one model variables such as encounter type, procedural justice indices, and the community members demographics are included. In level two, the officer's demographics as well as the groupings that they were assigned to are included. By using an HLM, we'll be able to identify differences across officers and their groupings, as well as differences with officers from the perspective of the community member. These models will be used to determine differences in a number of outcomes, including procedural justice behaviors, community members' views towards uh, of department legitimacy and body-worn cameras, and their willingness to co-op and help the police. American policing has a long history of strained relations with the communities that they serve, a problem that has intensified by recent events across the country. Police have been a society's primary, in primary instrument for controlling crime and social disorder, and this authoritative power given to police has intensified the deep divide between communities and their policing departments. As departments begin using new technologies that have the potential to further that divide, a clear approach is needed to, for officers to most effectively inform the public and increase their trust with the police. Prior studies, some of which have been mentioned today, have demonstrated that body-worn cameras are yielding their intended impact. But the research has neglected an important sub sub subtext that is increasingly relevant given the tensions that exist between law enforcement and high crime communities, namely that there's a long history of distrust between these two entities. 
While cameras may have the ability to enhance transparency and accountability in response to that distrust, they may also have the unintended impacts on community perceptions towards the police. The field lacks the knowledge surrounding how community members' attitudes towards the camera and the police are affected as a result of the cameras being present during an encounter. It is unknown how the presence of this technology affects community members' views of the camera-equipped officers with whom they interact or with the police department as a whole. An individual may like the idea of having, the, may like the idea of the police using cameras to catch criminals, but that attitude may change once the camera is facing them. The Urban Institute's three-site evaluation is supported by multiple empirical data sources and it dives deep in, to, be, to better understand the outcomes of body-worn camera use.